everyone, and welcome to The Opinion, the talk show where your opinions matter. I am Mirna Santiago, and joining me today for our discussion is my co-host, Adeline Ortiz, and our guest today, Professor Andres Torres. Welcome, Andres. Glad to be here. <laughs> today we're discussing tenure for educators and whether or not it makes for effective teachers or just breeds uh, complacency and accountability. What do you think? Well, you already know what I think. I think <laughs> tenure for educators absolutely breeds c uh, complacency. It creates a lack of accountability. I think Ted, in the educational setting is the only sort of education, uh, in the education setting is the only profession where people are rewarded for bad performance. <laughs> um, in New York City, for instance, cannot get rid of poorly performing teachers. In New York City, they put them in rubber rooms. So if, if you've been accused of some sort of, uh, you know, uh, behavioral issue, if you're incompetent, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're not doing your lesson plans, they take them out of the classroom, yes, yeah, so they're not exposed to the children, but they're putting them in rubber rooms where they're surfing the net, they're on the internet, they're <laughs> talking, they're reading the newspaper, and they're still on the municipality's <laughs> dime. So it's the taxpayer's dime. And Whenever anyone tries to remove those teachers, the teachers' union will fight them tooth and nail for it. And it's not just a New York issue. Uh, you know, we're in New York, and it's not just a New York City or a New York issue. The same thing happened in California. In California, they tried to move the tenure from uh, two to five years. So they were saying two years wasn't enough time for them to know what that teacher was made of. And they wanted to move the process to five years. And the teachers union actually fought them tooth and nail there as well. And they raised so much money from dues and from other people that they were able to you know, create this legal battle and keep the municipality from doing it. So I, I think it breeds complacency. <laughs> Well, um, I was an adjunct professor for over seven years, and I can tell you it is probably one of the most difficult and challenging jobs I've, I've ever done. I mean, I, I can't tell you the countless hours that I've put into planning lessons for my students, and um, I, I have to say that you know, teaching really doesn't play, pay that much, especially on the public school level. So I am absolutely in favor of this sort of job protection. And when you talk about getting, getting rid of people who are, are, are incompetent um, or not doing their job, for God's sake, look at any, any, any number of government entities. Anyone who has ever had to visit the Department of Motor Vehicles knows exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Um, I think that tenure is not a lifetime appointment. It is not, um, you know, 100% protection or immunity against dismissal. And that teachers who are performing poorly can be let go, can be terminated. Um, Dr. Torres, I mean, you've been a professor for many years, so I'm sure you have some strong ideas about this topic. Well, uh, I guess I'm one of the guilty partners here, <laughs> uh, parties here. Uh, I absolutely uh, do believe in tenure. Uh, I, but speaking to at the mm -hmm. higher education level, uh, but speaking to the issue at hand, uh, which is surfaced because of the latest initiatives in the state and in other states to eliminate tenure for uh, K through 12 educators. Uh, actually, there has been quite a bit of movement towards improving and, and tightening the quality control, so to speak, of uh, the uh, educators through the new protocols on evaluation of teachers. New York City is uh, extending the time period before any teacher uh, gets a promotion uh, <coughs> and tenure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just recently, for example, uh, the Bloomberg administration uh, has, uh, after three years, only approved, the Board of Ed has only approved uh, a little more than half of educators in the school system. The, and, and we're talking about the largest school system in the country. Uh, there's an extension for another 35, 40 percent of teachers for another year of probation. So it's getting uh, tougher and tougher for educators to get into that uh, level of tenure, which I think uh, is a reflection of just the need to uh, make sure that we have educators that are adapting and are prepared and are truly cut out for 
the role of teaching, especially in our changing public schools with the changing demographics. Uh, we have more kids in the school system, a more diverse student body, and this really requires a, a teaching core which is uh, committed, which is devoted, which is even loving of those students. And uh, too often, many of our teachers uh, burn out within the first, through, uh, first few years anyway, uh, because uh, it, they, they discover that despite all the training that they've been through and, uh, you know, towards the uh, teaching profession, they're not really made for that kind of commitment and mm. the creativity, the immense devotion and energy that it entails going into uh, every day working with uh, young, active, creative, and oftentimes uh, unpolished, shall we say, students uh, <laughs> who need to, you know, be uh, acclimated to uh, the changing uh, classrooms. So there's heavy demand on our teachers. And I think that uh, a system of uh, fair evaluations is part of that process to make sure that we're only bringing in those who are truly uh, committed to our students, but also as a measure of respect and of protections for educators uh, who, after all, can be at the mercy of uh, politicians and uh, also a flawed administrators um, and school boards uh, who often go through an election process that is not all that objective towards uh, hmm. the needs of our students. Uh, so there needs to be in the education field some sort of longer term uh, protections and uh, guidelines for uh, making sure that we have a, uh, a stable teaching core because teaching is about lifelong uh, learning and following those kids through uh, various I, uh, I think, stages of life. I think I agree with everything you said except the last part where you said you know it's about lifelong because that's really what these teachers are doing they're staying there for a lifetime and when you're talking about I, I think you mentioned about the teachers burning out within the first couple of years and that's fine I think that happens in any profession. Um, I uh, graduated from law school 16 years ago and my legal profession has gone through several incarnations already, from being a litigator to being in the attorney general's office to being in-house for insurance companies to coming back now to being in in-house um, as a defense counsel. That's okay. I think we need to leave it open for people to have those incarnations in their careers. And if you're burning out at the two or five year mark, then you need to go. I think that if I would have been in a job where they were paying me no matter how badly I performed and I knew I was going to get a pension and I knew they couldn't kick me out no matter how badly I performed I would still be in that job today and that's what's happen happening with a lot of these teachers where you have the teachers that are going in and they've gone to college and now they're in this public school system let's say in New York City and they're looking at these kids they no longer have a love for the teaching the kids are driving them crazy but you know what it's a set salary and if I do horribly, they can't kick me out. I go to a rubber room. You know, where's, where's the accountability? Where's, you know, there, there's no downside. It's a win-win for me no matter what happens. And that's exactly what is happening with a lot of the municipalities. Now, also, I think we need to go with the times because tenure was created because of the draconian measures in which the, the Board of Education, in which the municipalities were run. And since the teachers were mostly young women, if they got pregnant, they would get fired. If they didn't go to church, you know, or if they didn't go to a particular church, they would get fired. So the unions kind of formed in order to protect them. We don't have those issues today. We have employment laws. We have labor laws. And there's really no need for the sort of, of uh, setup that we have with the 10 years for the teacher that we have. There's no reason for it to exist. <laughs> well, um, I, there's no question that you know, discriminatory practices are, are alive and well today, although I don't think that that is still the basis for, for tenure for teachers. Um, I think that it certainly still exists. Uh, I do think that, that, that you know, the teachers have to be concerned with a lot of different factors, and certainly Dr. Torres raised some important concerns. You don't want a lot of turnover, like, like you mentioned, all of the different twists and turns that your professional career has taken in the, in the private sector. We really don't want that in the academic system. You know, you, you want 
your children to see those same faces year after year. I have uh, two, you know, uh, elementary school aged and middle school aged children, and um, and I know that it's important to them to see their teachers from last year in the in the in the following year. As a college professor, when I was teaching, I know that it was important for my students to be able to come back next year or in two years or in three years when they graduated and ask me for letters of recommendation for their employers or letters of recommendation for graduates school uh, you want to have that 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 continuity and if they're and, but if they're doing their job correctly then they will have that continuity what I want for my son is to see teachers who are engaged and creative and happy I don't want him to see a burned out teacher even if she's there for 10 years I think it's unrealistic because you know what you really you don't see that anywhere I've worked in in the private sector for a while too I've worked in the in insurance industry and so on and and I can tell you that you don't see people who are engaged and happy and and cheerful all day long you're gonna have different dynamics just as different as every individual is from one another you're certainly going to have that but professors have to be concerned with a lot of different things too I mean you have to remember unlike the typical office um, where you're dealing with the same you know professional mm -hmm. cultural dynamic every single day um, the, you don't have that in the academic setting your student pool changes every 16 weeks you're dealing with a new group of individuals and depending on how many courses you teach that could be a couple of a hundred new faces that you're you're dealing with mm -hmm. every 16 weeks and and issues certainly arise especially when you're dealing with young impressionable students you you can have any multitude of issues arise and I can give you an example when I was teaching I once had a student show up in my office with a bottle of wine and ask me for a date. <laughs> I had to throw him out of my office. Okay, but but these things happen, and and you know it's certainly there is opportunity there for false accusations against the teachers. Mm -hmm. There's opportunity for a student to to raise any number of issues because they're failing the course. They're not doing well. They look for ways to attack. Teacher, you don't want that teacher's job jeopardized every 16 weeks because 20 of those 200 students are going to hate you no matter how wonderful you are. You, you can rest assured that there are going to be a couple of dozen students who are not going to like you, who are failing your course, who are going to find ways to attack you and to have that administration look at you. And, and I don't think that, that teachers should be subjected to that. I think that, that they deserve to continue to have the tenure and to have that measure of job protection while at the same time um, you know, giving protections to the students as well and to be able to investigate legitimate complaints versus is all of the false things that can arise in in the course of your teaching career. I have to say though that in, in the higher education setting I don't have a problem so much with tenure because those are highly skilled jobs. You want somebody who's teaching uh, a chemistry course to be a chemist, to have the PhD in chemistry. You want someone who's teaching an engineering course to have to have that highly skilled labor. That's okay. When we're talking about someone who has a four-year degree or maybe you know another year or two masters and they're right out of college and they're burnt out already. They don't want to deal with these bratty little kids, unfortunately. Um, and now they have tenure because they've been given tenure in two years. I barely got to know my husband within two years, much less, you know, a tenure position where they're telling them, you are here for life. We're going to give you a pension. We're going to, you know, you're here. This is, this is you after two years. I think it's, it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous to guarantee somebody uh, basically a lifelong ap appointment because you're saying it's not lifelong, but it is. They can be there for 20, 25, 30 years and have absolutely burned out, be uncreative, be tired of it, and they're still there. And I've seen those types of teachers. <laughs> I think we're looking for a, a, a happy medium between mm -hmm. an institution called tenure mm -hmm. uh, and the abuse of it by a small number of people. I disagree right. that it's a generalized problem. Uh, it's a uh, small number as in any profession. As we say, rotten apples in every barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a small number of people in every job, in every occupation, in every profession who really are hiding behind protections that have been fought for and achieved uh, by the majority of their co-workers over time. That's what the unions are, are all about. There are people who hide behind the power of their unions and know really participate uh, fully and don't really speak true to their 
their mission. I think the steps that are now underway will prevent increasingly that situation to occur into the future. Uh, we're not going to ever go back and get rid of all the burnt out teachers who are in their 20, 30. They're going to just phase out on their own. It's a process of attrition. Now, the flip side of this is uh, we can't separate the discussion about tenure, teacher evaluation, and so forth from the larger political scene here. Sure. And that larger political scene, I believe, uh, because w the voices that are coming up now in various states around d uh, elimination of tenure are precisely those from conservative governors who are the same ones mm -hmm. going after uh, collective bargaining, they're going after the unions, they believe that the way to uh, make the labor force more flexible, as they say, more congenial to profit making by the big corporations, mm -hmm. is to start weakening the unions. And sure enough, on the sidelines of this whole debate around tenure uh, are these large uh, for-profit educational institutions, their, enter their, their you know, business enterprises, mm -hmm. who are looking to gradually move in and privatize education in the United States. Mm -hmm. I doubt that that will ever happen. It's just uh, too many people. Mm -hmm. Education is a public good, just like national security, just like I believe national health should be. Mm -hmm. All the advanced societies mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, Japan and so forth, uh, Sweden and so forth, uh, you know, have these public goods for the uh, public good. <laughs> we need to have these services available to everyone and, 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 and as, a, as a right, as a democratic right. The privatization of public education is just substituting the profit motive for the motive of educating citizens and workers for our society. And that's where the tricky issue here becomes. How to ensure that we constantly improve the quality of our educators, uh, you know, and, and making sure that they evolve themselves professionally over time through constant training and redevelopment and professional uh, development, which they are bound to do uh, without eliminating a basic uh, standard of protections, which I believe, contrary to eliminating it, those kinds of protections should be generalized and expanded to a much larger segment of the workforce in general. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah. I, I disagree. I disagree. I think we have a duty to eliminate government waste. And when you think about the fact that it takes $50,000 in legal fees to, to push out an underperforming teacher. Um, it, and imagine that happening over the course of years and years and years, how many millions of dollars we're wasting that way. And if you also think about the fact that not, not many jobs have that sort of protection, you're talking about basic protection for, for workers, not many jobs have that. I, I worked at the Attorney General's office under Dennis Vaco, and when Dennis Vaco was, uh, was voted out of office, you know, as people, the electorate voted him out, they didn't want him there anymore. The new person came in, it was Spitzer, and he brought in all his own attorneys. And all of us had to go and find other jobs. And that's okay, because, you know, our loyalty was obviously to Dennis Vaco, and, and he had a right to question that, whether we would be committed to doing the same job under a new attorney general. But what's the difference between that kind of an appointment, a managerial appointment, mm -hmm. you serve at the pleasure of the person who is your supervisor, right. and a rank-and-file educator who is daily tasked with forming the minds, that, those open minds of and, young people. And if you cannot do it because you're burnt out or you're tired or you simply do not have the mental ca you know, capacity or capability to do it anymore, then you should be able to, the municipality should be able to walk in and give you your walking papers. They should say you are no longer doing the job <laughs> you were hired to do. Go find something else where you'll be happier. There's no reason why you should be in a rubber room for five years. Do There's you agree that there should be some uh, criteria for the evaluation of those teachers? Absolutely. Well, we agree there. <laughs> we agree Thank there. You. The one thing we've agreed yeah. about. The reality is, is that unions, <laughs> politics, <Yeah>. manipulations <laughs> just exist in absolutely every forum. And, and think about it. Uh, if that wasn't the case, wouldn't uh, look at look at the pharmaceutical companies? W wouldn't we all ha have the benefits that you're 
talking about, uh, Andres, when you say that we should all have health insurance and this is all in the interest of public good? Well, of course it is, except we can't have it. Why? Because Americans are hostage to pharmaceutical companies and the, the rising costs of um, medication and health care costs and so on and so forth. And for the most part, it's because the pharmaceutical companies that are in complete control of, of this system. And, and who's in control of them? Who gets to oversee them? Congress and, and well, so on. Yeah, we've, we've they're discussed all in that bed before. Together. We've they're discussed all in bed that together, before right? about the fact that, that whoever has the money holds the power, and pharmaceutical companies have billions of dollars to, pro to lobby Congress and the legislators. But now that's also becoming the issue with teachers' unions because they have millions of dollars and they are lobbying. Excellent. They're and making, they should be. They're making sure. But, and but, they we, be. but we have uh, these teachers no. who are now not doing their Te jobs. Teachers have to meet. You're, you're talking about the exception, Myrna. You're no. really talking about the exception. You're not no. talking about the general. Um, in, in general, in my experience, what I've seen on the on the college level and in, in elementary, middle school level, is that teachers really put a lot of passion and energy into what they do. They Some. love what they do. Some. Many, many. And, and we need to and be able to kick the ones students. that don't. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> and then there's a process for getting rid of the ones that are just egregiously, you know, out of out of hand and what, not doing their jobs. They're, 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 so in the <laughs> they're, they're, they're in the rubber room. They're in the rubber room. room. Eventually, they'll have bounce their own have, way out. Having a latte and drinking. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> the is they have to meet rigorous academic requirements. They have to meet licensing requirements, certification requirements, continuing education. And, and I can't tell you the number of teachers, including myself, for, for nearly eight years on the college level that invested hundreds of dollars, even a couple of thousand dollars a year into um, providing tools and resources to, to, to bring to the classroom to enhance their lessons, to enhance their students' educations. And they're doing that. Why? Because they, they love what they do. They, they're truly passionate about what they do. And they, their, their students' education are so important to them that they are willing to make this personal investment and sacrifice out of their own pockets. And the good ones will do that regardless of whether there's tenure or not. They'll understand that it's merit-based and, and we're going to give them raises and we're going to provide support for them, but the ones that don't need to be kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we, we're running out of time um, for the show, so let's move on to our lightning round, Ooh. shall we? Now, this past election was a nail-biter for a lot of people and political pundits were uh, saying that it appeared to, to really come down to the Latinos in this election. So, and no one really knew until the very end which way the Latinos were going to go. So the question, I guess, for you guys is, are Latinos the key to any presidential victory going forward from here on in? Yeah. Well, let's Anyone who did not know how Latinos were going to vote in this election was not a Latino. Okay, mm -hmm. plain and simply. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a no-brainer. You had Romney, who is a cheerleader for giant corporations and the upper class and raising taxes and all that. Well, unfortunately, for the most part, you know, the, uh, the Hispanic is, Hispanics who live in this country don't fall into either of those categories mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it was pretty, you know, Pretty easy to, to, to say that uh, you know you you were gonna go you were gonna go with Obama if you're Hispanic mm -hmm. for the most part of course again I'm, I'm generalizing um, but I I think that the Latino vote was critical in this election it wasn't the key but it was an important element in this election and is going to continue to be an important el um, element in future elections I don't think that historically Hispanics have been very proactive mm -hmm. in the in the electoral process and the vote voting process and, in, and active in, in government, but I think that they really did take action in this one mm -hmm. and that it was a, a really important element. Um, many Latinos are unfortunately still battling, you know, the glass ceilings and looking for, for corner offices. So uh, again, Romney was, was not going to be um, the candidate that, that most of them were going to vote for in this election. So yes, absolutely, they were key. They were key. Okay, I, uh, I would agree that they were... Uh, key and they will be a, an important uh, element going forward in future presidential elections. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, one way in which <coughs> Republicans uh, will actually benefit from the growth of the Latino population <coughs> is the fact that many Latinos are moving to red state areas mm -hmm. uh, in the southeast, for example, <coughs> in the deep south. And so those states actually saw a rise in their populations, which allowed them to qualify for 
uh, more Congress people. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were nine states, uh, nine additional Congress people uh, sent to uh, Washington, D.C. from red states where the increase in their population was because of Latinos. Mm -hmm. So now that's something that Republicans should see as mm -hmm. uh, an opportunity, but only if they don't blow it yeah. like they did this <laughs> last time around. And they have to find ways to reach out to the Hispanic population, which after all is going to continue to grow as part of the electorate. and. Uh, they can be a part of a reinventing of the Republican Party, I believe. Mm -hmm. But they've got their work cut out for them. They do. <laughs> and I think, un I, I honestly don't think we were lucky as Latinos because we're such a minute part of the population still. We're still only at 30 percent. So, And the good thing about Latinos, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, depending on, on which side of the aisle you're on, it seems to be that the Latinos are moving sort of, they're voting in block. So the Latinos are not voting strictly Democratic. They're not voting strictly Republican. They're kind of looking at the candidates and seeing who's more friendly to their issues and, and their future, whether it's immigration, whether it's taxes, whether it's education, yes. and voting that way. So that, that voting block is actually up for grabs, which it'll be interesting to see going forward what happens. And what I'm curious about, though, is how do they decide who's a Latino? Because if you look <laughs> at me, I'm black. So, you know, but I, I'm of Hispanic descent. So I'm, you know, I, I consider myself Latina. So do they count me twice? Do they count me as black? <laughs> like, you know, I, I just don't understand how, how they decide. But I hope they figure it out going forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I mean, I, I think that... Um, when you say, you know, Latinos make up for 30% of the population, mm -hmm. that may be so, but, you know, it's not 30% of the voting population, mm -hmm. and that's important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, like I said, historically, since they, they, they haven't voted for the most part, um, they are now, those who are within that, you know, eligible to vote, are registering to vote, are now taking a, a proactive stance mm -hmm. in, in government, are paying attention to the issues, they are listening to what mm -hmm. um, these politicians are saying, they are watching the debates, and, and I think that, that in my lifetime, this is probably the first time I've ever really seen that happen, where um, Hispanics are in, you know, openly and proactively engaging in political discussions and, and getting animated about the candidates and the issues. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, just, it's a very important piece of, of uh, future elections. So, well, that, that's really all the time we have for our discussion today, but we do look forward to hearing from everyone out there on, on this topic mm -hmm. and the other topics for the opinion. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thanks.